Welcome along to the penultimate episode of Ask GC Anything for 2016. Today I'm going to be doing my best to answer 10 of your questions. Don't forget, if you want to ask us a question, you can do so via social media using the hashtag TalkBack, or you can simply put your questions in the comment section, which you will find below this video. Right, let's start off with this one that comes in from Santiago Palanzares. What's the difference between rollers and trainers, and which ones do you prefer? Well, let's start with the differences between the two. A home trainer will generally support your bike at the rear wheel, which means it will balance on its own and doesn't require any balancing from you whilst you are riding it. In general, at the very least, home trainers will offer you a few degrees of differences in terms of the resistance at the rear wheel so that you can go hard when you want to go hard and easy when you want to go easy. Rollers, on the other hand, are slightly different. You put your bike on them and there are two rollers at the rear wheel and one roller at the front wheel. However, your bike will not stand on them on its own. You will need to use the motion of the wheels as you are riding to help balance your bike on top of them. And I can tell you, this is slightly harder than the pros make it look, and you're gonna see a bit about that later on. Now with most rollers, there is no degree of resistance setting. There are on some, but for the majority of them, there's just one setting and that is reasonably easy. So from my own personal perspective, if I wanted to do some decent indoor training, I would always use a home trainer. However, some people swear by rollers in terms of improving their pedaling style and their cadence, and you'll often see pro track riders warming up and cooling down on a set of rollers. Right, for proof as to just how hard rollers are to ride, we put our very own Matt Stevens on a set for the first time about a year ago in this next video, which is entitled, How to Ride the Rollers, A Beginner's Guide. Now, once you've got one leg either side of the bike, apply both brakes and then clip into the pedal if you're using clips pedals on the side that's furthest away from the wall. And next, using the wall to pop yourself up with the brakes still applied, you're then able to put the pedal in on the other side. Now Matt is ready to start pedaling. I'm gonna just stand here. Our next question comes in from Manuel Segovia who asks, is there any information, videos or suggestions on how often you should pedal standing versus sitting when you are on a long climb? Well, no, we haven't made a video giving recommendations on how long you should spend in or out of the saddle on a long climb, even though we have done videos showing you the technique of getting out of the saddle and even been in a laboratory to test out how much difference there is in getting in versus, the, versus out of the saddle in terms of how much energy you are expending and the effort involved. Now, the reason that we haven't done the recommendation is for good reason. We think it's very much down to personal preference. So let's take two professional riders as an example. Alberto Contador seems to spend the majority of climbs out of the saddle, whereas Bradley Wiggins spent almost all of his time in the saddle. Now, they've both won the biggest race of them all, the Tour de France, so it works for both of them. One place though where I would say that being out of the saddle is beneficial is on short, steep climbs. And they don't come much deeper than 30%, which is what Cy had to contend with over in the US of A for this next video. A 30% climb done both in and out of the saddle, he tests the differences. Which is fastest, in the saddle or out of the saddle? And yes, that is Jones Street, and it is a casual one in three or 30%. It's the quick fire round. The first question for this one comes in from James Meyer. You have a lot of good information in a lot of videos, but how do I search for a particular topic or info on GCN? Well, if you log on to youtube.com forward slash GCN and get to our homepage, you will find a tab near the top of the page which says playlists. In there, we've got plenty of playlists on various subjects to do with cycling. But a little bit further along to the right, you will see a small magnifying glass, which allows you to search through our thousands of videos to find the one that you want hopefully. Next up, Justin Wolstad asks, Hi GCN, is it okay to hang a bicycle with carbon wheels by said carbon wheels from a hook screwed into the wall or the ceiling? Well, I would say that yes, it's fine, so long as it is a proper bike hook rather than just a screw or a nail which can have some sharp edges, then you are fine to hang your bike by your carbon wheels. Shaneva asks, does the rolling resistance and grip of a tyre change as it wears? 
I don't know the answer definitively for the first part of that question. My instinct would be that the rolling resistance would come down slightly as the tyre wears. You'll often find that tyres that are more supple and more lightweight have a lower rolling resistance and of course when you lose the rubber from your tyre it is getting more supple and lighter weight. In terms of the grip, actually after using your brand new tyres for a week or two the grip will get slightly better because it will wear off whatever it is that comes from the factory over the surface of the tyre. But again, I would imagine that towards the end of its life, there's going to come a point when the grip is sacrificed somewhat. Benjamin Smith writes in and says, is it really worth paying the extra for Ultegra or Dura Ace Di2 over good old fashioned mechanical shifting? Again, this is one that comes down to personal choice and in some ways budget too. If you're really scrabbling around for the pennies to be able to afford Di2 shifting, then probably not going to be worth it in terms of the gains and comfort you're going to get from the electronic shifting. However, if money is no object, you might well purchase it and try it and wonder how you ever did without it. After all though, some pros still use mechanical shifting shifting out of choice, one of the last of those being Fabian Cancellara who has since retired, so he was one of the last of the old guard. From a personal point of view, I absolutely love them, I think they're great. Finally, Matthew Bell asks, if air temperature affects lap times on the track, should I expect to see a slower average speed in the winter versus the summer? Well, the air temperature isn't necessarily higher in the winter versus summer. It can be, but you can also get very high air temperatures in the summer too. But it will affect your speed out on the open road too, which is why Eddie Merckx did his hour record all those years ago in Mexico City at high altitude where the air pressure is lower. He couldn't put out as much power, but he was still going faster. Now you will go slower in the winter anyhow in general because you'll normally weigh a bit more with the extra kit that you're having to put on and also that extra kit provides more air resistance because you're not as aero. Our next inquiry comes in from Lee Simmons who says, I end up with a numb or tingling finger after a ride of over 40 miles or two hours. Is there any way to reduce this or ideally stop it altogether? Well, yeah, there are a few things that you can do to try and stop it altogether. It's all about reducing the amount of pressure that's on your hands whilst you're out riding. So you could try double wrapping your bar tape, investing in some larger tires and run them at a lower pressure, or you could change your positions so that there's less weight on your hands and your wrists and your arms and more weight on your bum on the saddle. Now we went into this in quite some detail, myself and Tom last in this next video. So there are a few suggestions that you might be able to try up here. Now as long, along with trying to relax your wrists and your hands, you can also try to take some of the weight off the arms themselves. And one way to do this is to recruit your core. And this is something you can practice on the home trainer, keeping this position on the bike whilst removing your hands from the bars. That way you're going to recruit more of your core muscles and your arms, hands and wrists are going to be bearing less weight. Well, I'm afraid we're already on to our final question for this week. It comes in from Justin Stone. Is there an optimal pedal position for when you're switching gears? Well, this is a really interesting question and not one I'd actually ever thought about before. And I have been thinking about where my pedals normally are when I go to change gears. And I think that actually I'm generally just coming onto the downstroke when I choose to change gears. I'm not sure that there is a completely optimal position, but what you do want to make sure you do is let off the power slightly when you are changing gears. If you keep the power going through the pedals when you try and change the chain onto, from one cog onto the other, you can get that awful crunching sound, which isn't particularly good for your gears. So I guess from that point of view, maybe the optimal position is at the six and 12 o'clock, because at that point, you're unable to get too much power through the pedals anyway. Maybe something to try next time you're out on a ride and just see which one works best for you and your gears. Anyway, what we have got is some advice on the best ways of changing gears like a pro. It's up here. There is an optimum range, however, of between 70 to 100 revolutions per minute. Gear changes should be made to keep yourself in this range whilst maintaining your desired effort level. There is no way of telling what gear should be used in a given situation as it depends on a rider's personal ability. Well, thank you very much for watching. Apologies if we haven't answered your question this time around, but keep trying and hopefully one week we will get around to it. If you haven't already subscribed to the Global Cycling Network, make sure you do so by clicking on the globe before you head off to these next two videos, which I think you might like. In the top corner there is my latest pro bike, that rather nice looking Canyon Ultimate CF SLX. And in the bottom corner are the top 10 bikes of the Pro Peloton for 2016. We calculated that using some amazingly complicated algorithms.